How are you? There it is. All right. Ah, ooh. Acts chapter 11, if you guys would turn there. Pastor Mowdy already said, if you would, man, you know, be sure to take good notes. We do ask to share something that you heard today or learned today that you want to apply to yourself this week. And so uh, if you need a Bible, by the way, they're on the chairs in front of you. It's page 919. I can get you there quickly. But yeah, we want to talk about what we heard today and how it applies to our life. We share that at the end of the message with each other. We take a couple of minutes just to help apply it to our lives. So the passage today is one of those uh, transitional passages in Acts. In fact, we're going to finish the first part of Acts today, and then next week starts kind of the second part of Acts. Can you guys start the timer, please? We'd be here all day otherwise, which is fine with me. All good. But uh, nothing from you guys. Okay, wake up. Time to wake up. All right, ready? We can do this. All right, so we're in this transitional piece of Acts, right? The first part is coming to a close, and we're, we're moving to the second part of Acts. We're going to see why such a big transition takes place today. Now, the church is always, or feels like we're always in some kind of transition. The world we live in feels like it's constantly changing and in transition. I just kind of just thought of some things over the last, you know, three or four years, right? COVID and then racial tensions in America, those two things shook up what church looks like for sure. Uh, right after that, we had another presidential election, which we're getting ready to do again. Political seasons always shake up things in culture. Uh, you know, not long ago, man, a new war kicked off, and now uh, we're having some conflicts also, not just the one in Israel, but we, we've moved into some things, right? Global crises are always taking place. And all the while, culture is moving further away from where we are. Or at least it feels that way. Probably, it's probably true that culture has always been far away from where we are. But it feels like that the ground underneath us is moving and that the church is, a, is constantly in that kind of transitional place. And that's where Acts 11 and 12 kind of take place. In fact, this is a passage that might often get skipped is it just kind of a transition, but I think there's something there for us today. So I'm going to ask this question over and over again. When the, when the world feels like it is changing around us, what are we to do? All right, so we're going to ask that a few times today. So here's the main idea for today. We'll put this on the screen. Acts 11 and 12 show the Jerusalem church enduring significant change both internally and externally, giving us challenges to apply to our context today. They're going through some internal change, and they're going through some external change. We'll see both of those things today. And what they do, right or wrong, right? When they struggle, we find our struggles in that. When they succeed, we find what we're called to do. But in that, we find some things that challenge us in what we, to do, what we do today when we feel like we're in transition. So Acts 11, let's pick up in verse 1. It says, now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So here's where we are. If you missed last week, this is kind of the transition from what happened last week to now Peter, our kind of lead apostle in this moment, is going to retell the story from what happened last week right? And so Peter is not in Jerusalem at the time. He's out in Joppa. And then he gets called by some people to go visit a, an Italian soldier, right? A centurion, a guy over like a hundred guys, right? And he goes there. And, and, and before that, God had given him a vision he didn't understand. And he sees these unclean foods he's not supposed to eat, like shellfish and bacon or whatever. And he's like, okay, I don't get it. And, and then he goes to this guy's house, and he's non-Jewish, and Jews don't hang out with non-Jewish people. And so as he's invited in, there's that moment where, like, as he goes into the house, he's, he's doing something he's never done before, right? And he's putting these pieces together of this vision that God had given him of how that applies to what's going on. And as he goes in, he shares the gospel with Cornelius and all the people gathered in Cornelius' house and we see the Holy Spirit fall on the people inside. And, and we see really what's important is the conversion of the first truly non-Jewish people. So Christianity is birthed in Jerusalem as a fulfillment to Jewish scripture. A Jewish savior comes. 
And so you can see, if you kind of keep playing this out, that we think of it as a Jewish faith at this point. If we're going back 2,000 years, that's how they're seeing it, as a fulfillment of what God had said to the Jewish people, right? But that's not what Jesus had told them to do. He said, wait here until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When, when you're empowered by my Spirit, and then you're going to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, which is kind of half Jewish, if you will, and then to the ends of the world, which are non-Jewish. So Jesus already kind of gave them the roadmap, and that's really how the book of Acts is. It's Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, which we already saw, going out now to the ends of the earth, right? It kind of began last week. So the Jewish Christian church back in Jerusalem now hears about Peter eating with some non-Jewish people and going in a non-Jewish house, and they're critiquing him for breaking Jewish rules. And so they call him back to Jerusalem, because remember, he was, he was in Joppa and then went out and then came back, because he had men from Joppa with him, and now they're calling him to Jerusalem, and they have an issue with him, right? And, and remember, Christianity at this point is primarily Jewish, right? It is, it is Jewish people that believe that God had fulfilled his promises in the Savior who is both God and human in Jesus, and that Jesus is the fulfillment of, of the promises they've been waiting for to reconcile them to God. So it hasn't, it hasn't left Judaism yet. And even as persecution hits the church that drives out to Samaria, where they're kind of half Jewish and half not, or they meet an Ethiopian eunuch along the road who's actually a worshiper of God, right? And, and you see these things taking place, but they're kind of on the, on the margins of Judaism, and then last week, the, the conversion of Cornelius and all those with him are the first non-Jewish, truly non-Jewish converts to Christ. And so the Jewish Christian church is struggling to understand this. Verse 4. But Peter began and explained it to, to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and I saw in a trance of vision something like a great sheet descending being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me, and looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean, meaning nothing, nothing like non-kosher, has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean do not call common. Peter says, this happened three times, and it was all taken back up into heaven. So Peter goes back to the beginning of the story and says, listen, I was here, I had this vision from God that I didn't understand. And I saw these Jewish rules, this Jewish dietary law in front of me in a vision, things that were outside of it, and God is telling me to eat things outside of Jewish dietary law. And Peter says, I argued with God, Right? No, I've never, right? I haven't eaten bacon. I don't do that, right? But then God tells him, don't call unclean what I have said is clean, right? So Peter, he goes through this three times. He doesn't understand it, right? And, and as that kind of wraps up, there's a knock at the door, right? Verse 11, and behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which were sent to me from Caesarea. And the spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction, these six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. So there are six men that came from Joppa back to Jerusalem with Peter. And this is a detail that we didn't have in last week's chapter. In chapter 10, it doesn't mention how many people left from Joppa, but what we hear is that several men from Joppa went with him. We know that when Peter preaches in Cornelius' house, when, when the people are converted, we know that the other kind of Jewish Christians are there, that they understand what these converts are saying now. They're glorifying God. And Peter actually looks at them and says, what prevents us from baptizing? All that takes place, so there's men there. See, Acts has this emphasis of eyewitness accounts, right? What are the eyewitness accounts to the death and the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus? What are the eyewitness accounts in this case to the first conversion of non-Jewish people, and Peter's not there alone, he's with several men. Six of them returned to Jerusalem with him. Verse 13, and he, meaning Cornelius, the, 
the Italian soldier, told us how he had seen an angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. Now listen, Cornelius was praying. Cornelius was a quote-unquote worshiper of God. He worshiped God, right? But in this prayer, in this time, God tells him, hey, listen, I want you to send for Peter. He's going to come and tell you, and I want you to hear this language, Peter will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. Not in which you are saved, but in which you will be. So Cornelius is unsaved. He is, he is apart from God, right? We use the term saved, meaning this, that he is still under the penalty of his own sin. So let's back up. Let's look at how the gospel relates to Cornelius and how that impacts us today. So there's a God who created us, designed us, made us, right? And that God created a world without sin, without the brokenness that you and I experience every day. That God created humanity, designed humanity, put us in that world, created us to glorify God, enjoy the world we live in, be in relationship with one another. In fact, the command is be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, right? Now that has more than just a physical implication, like multiply that way, but multiply those who worship God. There's a faith implication there. And the commands are are few, do this, this is all good for you, don't do this one thing, that'll kill you. And of course, we know the story, humanity does the one thing they're told not to, they sin, they bring judgment and, and a curse upon themselves and upon us, we inherit that, and then we join the story thousands of years later, and we add to sin. Right? All of us know we do wrong things. In fact, in this church, we understand very well we do wrong things even knowing better. So if you're a guest here today, we're not saying you do wrong things, we're saying we do. Right? That we are equally culpable and guilty of sin. And those of us in Christ should know better and still fail to live up to God's plan for our lives. And so because of that, because of sin, we're separated from God. Like infidelity in a marriage breaks and severs the marriage, right? We're, we're now separate from God because of sin. But God knows we could never earn our way back or become holy or become perfect because we're just born broken, right? And so God, instead of calling us to him, which we can't do, God comes to us. So God becomes flesh, Jesus, the son of God. Fully God, yet fully human, comes and enters into human history and lives the life glorifying God that we were called to live without fail, was tempted and yet never sinned. He had victory where we have failure. And then he goes to the cross and trades his life for ours because the wages of the sin is death, death physical and death eternal. Separation from God physically and eternally spiritually. And so Jesus takes his perfect life And he trades it for ours. He endures the wrath of God for us that we deserve that he did not. But because he is God, he can can endure the wrath of God. And because he is human, he is the perfect human and sacrifice for us. So he takes our place. So he covers the gap and takes the penalty and and, and, and he, he trades himself for us. And then Jesus is laid in a grave to cover sin. Now, the story can't end there, but three days later, Jesus resurrects from the grave and lives forever. In fact, he reveals himself to hundreds of people, many of them here in this story, like Peter, right? Like James, who we'll see in a minute, right? And so he reveals himself as alive. He spends 30-something days on earth proving he's alive, then ascends back to heaven to be king, to be Lord over us. That at the cross, he becomes savior, right? And at the ascension, he becomes king. That he reconciles us to God. He covers the gap of our sin. He takes our penalty. He brings us back into relationship with God. And then he ascends back to heaven to be our Lord, our king, our savior, to lead us in life. And then we live this stretch of life in new life because of Jesus, because of the resurrection, because he is king, because he's poured out his spirit on us, that we live, if we're in Christ, we live empowered by the gospel, by the spirit of God, and we eagerly await one day where Jesus will make everything right. So those who are in Christ here have responded to Christ here, right? We've, we've trusted him to pay the debt of our sin, 
to cover what we have done wrong, to take our penalty in our place. And we live now under the lordship and reign of Jesus. So Cornelius, now where's Cornelius fit in this story? See, Cornelius is back here. He's still got his own sin. He's praying to God. In fact, he's doing good things. We learned about this last week. Like he's generous, he gives financially, he does things. These things can't fix him. And he's praying to God, it's a good step, but here's what God says. I want you to send for Peter. And here's what he says. Peter will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. You see, the gospel message is about Jesus. There's no salvation apart from Jesus, right? You can't just pray to God generically. You can't do good things. These two things are not enough, that the gospel must run through Jesus, right? That Jesus must pay our penalty, and we must have placed our faith in Jesus for that, We can't trust in our generic goodness or our actions and works, but in Christ alone. You with me? So though Cornelius is a good guy and his heart's in the right place, he is not yet saved from the penalty of his sin because he has not yet trusted in Christ. So he's still dead and under the the curse of his own sin. In John chapter 10, Jesus says it this way, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. He talks about himself being the the gate for the sheep to come in and out of, right? He says, I am the door. I'm the, I am the path. I am the way to God. Not one way, the way. In another passage, he says, I am the way, the truth, the life, right? That no one enters into, that no one comes to the Father but by Jesus. And so Cornelius needs Jesus, And God is leading him to Jesus by bringing Peter to him to proclaim the message, the gospel message to him. Verse 15, Peter says, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ... Who was I that I could stand in God's way? The emphasis of last week, Pastor John shared that the Holy Spirit becomes the proof, the marker of our identity in Christ, right? Which used to be external circumstances or dietary law or do this, don't do that. Instead, now in Christ, the Holy Spirit is the marker of who we are, whether we are in Christ or not. Right, that at baptism, the promise of baptism is the indwelling, God's spirit living within us, transforming us. So yes, we will look different. Our lives will change because of this, but it's not because we're becoming good people. We're becoming becoming empowered people in the gospel, right? That God is transforming us. We're not just working harder, doing more. Because remember, our works can never fix us. Our works can never save us. We have to run through. The gospel must move through the cross of Christ. The the penalty for our sin must be paid by Jesus. And then on the other side of that, as we trust in him, he becomes Lord of our life. So the Holy Spirit is proof of salvation. So circle back to the church in transition. So this gospel message has been the same thing since the beginning of the church, since Jesus ascends. That is the gospel. But see, the church is going through a change. See, it's been primarily Jewish here right? It's been made up of Jews who believe that God had made a promise all the way back in Genesis 3.15, and then all the way through Scripture that God has been repeating this promise, and that God has now fulfilled it in Christ, and that they are Jews who believe that God fulfilled his promise to Jews, and so they're here. But see, this Cornelius and all those in his house who came to faith, they're new. They're not Jewish. And the gospel has moved beyond Judaism, not just to semi judaish places, Jewish, Jew, whatever I mean in English, right? Hasn't just moved to the edges and margins of Judaism, but it's moved outside of Judaism. That's the change going on here in the church. So they call Peter, hey, Peter, I hear you ate with or went to non-Jewish people. You broke a Jewish rule, and yet you profess faith, trying to reconcile these things together. Today, we see divisions in church around things, right? Could be like in 2020, 
around issues of ethnicity, or it could be around issues of belief. It could be around issues of how we worship or what we do. And same idea. There's division often in the church. The church is a, is a highly divided thing in America. How do we saw, how do we how do we fix the division? Right, it must be found in Christ. So verse eighteen. <clears throat> when they, this is the Jewish Christian people that called Peter back, when they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, then, to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Gentiles, just a term, it means anything other than Jewish. Right? There's, like, white or everything else, or black and everything else, right? It's just a term that means not Jewish, right? So then to the rest of the world... God is also giving salvation. That's what he's saying. So they they hear this, and they understand the message. They hear from Peter, and they hear what God has said, and they they hear from Peter and the men that came with him from Joppa, and and they understand now that the gospel goes beyond this ethnic base, beyond this community, that it is for the world. It says they fell silent, and then they glorified God. So again, when the world feels like it's changing around us, what are some things What are some things that we can focus on as a church? What are things that we can do? So here's the first one, the church in transition. The Jerusalem church learns who all the gospel is for, then in turn glorifies God in unity and harmony. Conversion is always a source of joy for Christ's people. When people come to faith, that is always a source of joy for us, right? No matter what they look like, you look around the room, some very different people look different than you do. Right? And the, the, the source of joy is when anyone comes to faith, when anyone finds their salvation in Christ alone, that, that's a source of joy for the whole church, not just the local church, but we should celebrate that anywhere. People on the other side of the planet come to Jesus when we hear about it. We should, that should be a source of joy for us. In Luke 15, Jesus is speaking. He says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, don't make the mistake that there are righteous people that need no repentance. He's aiming at the religious elite that think they need no repentance, right? And he's telling them, listen, when someone comes to faith, that is great. Like heaven celebrates that, and we should too. Verse 19. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Let's just pause. So back in Acts 6, we meet Stephen. 7, he's executed. He's he's killed for the first Christian martyr. And he's a Hellenist Jew. He's a Jew that doesn't speak Hebrew. It's basically what that means. And he is, not him, he's executed. But those like him start up enduring persecution from religious leaders. And so as they're chased out of town, they begin sharing the gospel with others. That's where kind of some of those in Samaria and Judea came to faith, right? And so as they are going out, listen to what it says, they speak the word, meaning the gospel, to no one except Jews. You see the, kind of, you see the bias embedded in them? As they go to other places, they're not looking for everyone. They're kind of targeting one group of people. Verse 20. But there were some of them, the men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. In this case, Hellenist. Uh, Hellenist really means Greek-speaking or more Greek than anything else. And so when it was Hellenistic Jews back in Acts 6, it was talking about Greek-speaking Jews who don't speak Hebrew look more like the culture than they do like Judaism. In this case, it's just talking about non-Jewish people, Greek people, Greek culturally or ethnically people. And so what it says is that really as these people that are being persecuted and driven out of Jerusalem, as they go, they're sharing the gospel, but they're limiting themselves just to Jewish people. It's kind of like walking into a room and going straight to someone who looks like you and just kind of focusing there, right? As they go into a new city or area, they're aiming at people who look like, talk like, act like they do, sharing the gospel with them. But it says some Some who come to faith because of that, when they end up getting pushed out to another place called Antioch, which we're introduced to today, they share the gospel with non-Jewish people, right? You can see the move. You can see how it's embedded in the church of who this message is for. Because while this is going on at Jerusalem, these other people have already been pushed out of Jerusalem by persecution, 
And so they don't know what God has been doing through Peter and back home in Jerusalem. And so they're just taking their, their wrong understanding of the gospel out with them. So on the mission field, the emphasis of sharing Jesus was only two people like themselves, right? Verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Okay, so as we see this kind of, these people pushed out, and they're kind of aiming at Jewish people, but some don't. Some start sharing the gospel beyond their kind of race or ethnic base or religious base. So they start sharing with other people, and a lot of people start coming to the Lord. And there's this city, this hub, Antioch. If in this modern day, in this, this time, in the, mid fourth, in the mid first century, there were probably five massive economic hubs. Antioch was one of them. It was a lot like Long Beach here. Like Long Beach has the ports and shipping and, mar- and just all kinds of business and, and all kinds of wealth and, and all kinds of struggles, all kinds of, all kinds of things, right? It was like that. Antioch was a lot like Long Beach. And so it's this hub. It's this kind of economic base. And as the gospel gets there, some start sharing the gospel with anybody who will listen to them, and many start coming to faith. And so because of this, what we end up with is our first non-Jewish at all church. It is non-Jewish people that share the gospel outside of Judaism, and the gospel takes root in a very non-Jewish place. So Antioch is your first fully Gentile, if you will, or fully non-Jewish church. So back home in Jerusalem now, after they've had Peter come back, and they've changed their minds about who the gospel is for, they hear about Antioch. I told you this is this kind of transition or this pivot piece in Acts. We're going to move out of Jerusalem, and with the exception of coming back here for a council in four chapters, Jerusalem becomes a part of the past, and the church becomes a part of moving beyond it. And Antioch becomes its base until we get to Ephesus, and then there's another base. So there's this move or this shift. So the church in Jerusalem hears of this non-Jewish church, and what they do is they send a leader, Barnabas, if you remember Barnabas from Acts 4, they send one of their trusted leaders out to Antioch to help disciple them. So another question, so when when we feel like the world around us is changing or in transition, what are we to do? So here's another note, the church in transition. Antioch is a church outpost in a new territory. So the apostles or the leaders back in Jerusalem, they send leaders to help. Generous sharing of godly leadership is one way to participate from a distance. Right? Sharing of leadership, generous sharing of our leadership or another church's leadership is way, a way of participating in the kingdom beyond just our local church. I right, think back a year, I had major neck surgery. It came out of nowhere, uh, not nowhere, but it came on very suddenly, right? And we had the churches that we partner with, right? Bethany Baptist, Encounter, Imago Day, RCLA out in Linwood, all those like, they came in here and helped, right? Because not only do we need Sunday to be covered, right? But also the stuff I'm doing during the week and the stuff I'm doing during the week kind of goes out to Pastor Maudie, Pastor John, and we needed someone to come in. And so we had these pastors coming in. And, and then I go over there the beginning of last year, actually New Year's Day of last year. I was preaching at a different church. And then in the middle of the year, I'd go out and preach in the, over the summer at different churches, right? It's, it's how we serve one another. And in this case, they're not just sending out someone to cover a Sunday, but someone to really disciple them and embed them in the gospel, So they sent Barnabas, who we already know was a key leader in Jerusalem. They sent him out. They're really sending out their best. This year, we'll talk more about missions and church planting, right? And we've already talked about one set of missionaries and and, and, an agency that we're looking at partnering with maybe over this year. In the first four years, Generations just turned eight in January, In our first four years, we planted three other churches, and one of those church plants also planted a church. So four churches, right? And each time, we we would send people out. And then we sent out Pastor Vinny when he went to Idaho, right? And Brandon and April and all of them to help turn a church around in Idaho where they all are. Now, there's, there's literally 15 people in Boise, Idaho in a church this morning that came out of here. Right? And a lot of that was they thought they had their plans and other people. But with Vinny, it was a very 
This is a very thoughtful, is this what God is doing, right? And, and can, we, can we help be a part of that, right? And there's a healthy church now in Idaho in some ways because of a little bit of our sacrifice. That makes sense? The generous sharing of leaders, missions, church planting. That's part of the way that the church participates even as going through changes and enduring things. Verse 23, when he, meaning Barnabas, came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful in the Lord with steadfast purpose. Remember, Barnabas means son of encouragement, right? Note that he's just encouraging the church. Verse 24, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas goes, and he sees what's God, what God is doing. He encourages them, and then listen to this, verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Remember, Saul converted in Acts 9 from a persecutor of Christians to becoming a Christian to, after three years, starting to preach as a leader in Christianity. Verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Let's walk through that last line. So Barnabas and Saul, who we now call Paul, who wrote a good portion of the New Testament, right, in the letters to churches that he had helped pastor and start, they go there and they spend a year discipling this group. And the church is called disciples. The disciples early in Acts, what is the church of Jerusalem? The disciples, right? We are disciples because we're always being students of Jesus, because we've, we've never arrived, because we never fully get there, right? As long as we're in flesh, we will have things we need to change, need to learn, need to encourage one another with or in. And so they go there and, and they begin to train them and teach them about the gospel. And so their disciples, but in Antioch, they were first called Christians. The term we use today or is used most commonly, is Christian. Uh, we typically say like Christ follower or something because Christian has become so watered down today that it barely has meaning. But the first time it was ever used, you gotta hear this, like this is the first group of people that are actually identified as Jesus being primary above all else. That was true in the church in Jerusalem, but they were viewed as Jews and they viewed themselves as Jews. Right? Even though they began to follow Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promises, they still were kind of trapped in that place. As you move out and you get to this, this new outpost in Antioch, it's the first time that Christianity is seen as its own thing, separate from its history, separate from an ethnic group, separate from its roots, but truly being central to following Jesus. And that takes place in Antioch, as the church is moving and changing. Verse 27. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So this parenthetical note, right? The, the words in the parentheses are a, a note from the author Luke to us. So here's what's going on in the story. There, there's this prophet named Agabus from Jerusalem who comes out to Antioch. And this is significant because not only has Jerusalem sent leadership to, but Antioch is now included in whatever God is doing, right? Whatever's going on in what we'll call Christianity in the first century, these two ba big hubs, Jerusalem and Antioch, they're now viewed as equal. And so God says something here, and God sends a message to say the same thing over here. And so Agabus goes and tells them there's about to be a famine over the world, right? That the world is going to suffer under conditions that prevent them from having enough food. So that's the warning. Luke tells us this warning, this famine actually took place under the next Caesar. So right around the mid first century. Verse 29, so it says the disciples determined everyone, this is the disciples in Antioch. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So I want you to hear this. So the disciples, the church, not the pastors, not the elders, the church decided, right? We've leaned into over last year, really the role of belonging to a church, of being a member of a church and what that means. And it really comes with an authority 
at a voice. And it says the, 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 the disciples, the people, the church, right? We'd say the members maybe. Everyone according to his ability would send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Notice the term brothers. They see them now as family in Christ, right? That just because they're non-Jewish and they're Jewish, they're still brothers They're sons and daughters of God. They're still brothers and sisters in Jesus. You see the parity here, the equality, the equity between Jerusalem and Antioch. They send leadership because they need something. God speaks. He speaks to both, right? There's a need. They send back. He will send to, notice it says, the elders in Jerusalem. Jerusalem has become an elder-led church under a man named James, the brother of Jesus. Not James the apostle, who we'll see in just a second. Right? But now we see these two outposts for Christianity, one in a very Jewish context, one in a very non-Jewish context. So when the world feels like it's changing around us, when things are going on and, and we can't necessarily fix the things that are going on, what do we do? So here's another note. The church in Antioch hears from Jerusalem that a famine is coming, and so they give financially. Financial generosity is a way that churches can participate together. Right? When someone's in need, maybe we can't fix their need, but maybe we can help them. Right? We started this year or, or mid-January, and we, we talked to you about Reformed Church LA in Linwood with Pastor Rudy Rubio, a church plant we support. Right? He's new. He's in, very hard, in a very hard area with, with very little financial resource, and we support them monthly. Right? When I say we, Your giving, what we give collectively, not me as a leader, you as the church, we as the church, what we give, we give away 10%, right? Just like we call ourselves a tithe, our church tithes outside of our church. Part of that is we give to Reformed Church LA. We give to Rudy Rubio and their church in Linwood, Chris Marquez and those guys there. Because we can't really solve everything for them, but we can support them. When the church is in transition, when the church has needs, sometimes we can't always fix it, but we can, we can help. We can share leadership. We maybe can send finances. Maybe the ones in, we're the ones in need, whatever that looks like. All right, Acts chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. So this is during the Passover feast. So here's what happens. James, the brother of John, you, James, Peter, John, the three, the closest to Jesus while Jesus was alive and on earth and doing his three years of vocational ministry, right? We're talking about Peter. We talked about John, now James. And Herod, a king, uh, a Jewish ethnically, but not very Jewish, but a, a king, Herod, arrests James and executes him because it pleases the Jewish people. And then he seeks to arrest Peter also. So here's what's going on. For the first time, the church, the followers of Jesus, are being persecuted by government oppression, right? This is separate from religion. Though he is ethnically Jewish, he's not a practicing Jew. He's not religiously Jewish. In fact, he is far more other than he is Jewish. But he is the king over this area. And this political unrest between Christianity that's been taking root in Jerusalem and traditional Judaism that's been in Jerusalem since its establishment, this pressure, this opposition, the very things that we saw killed Stephen back in Acts 7. Now it bubbles over into government. This is a very different thing when government is the problem. When it's another religious base, that's one thing. When it's government that is oppressing the church, it's a new thing. Now, we may not experience this here in the way that we're talking about, right? Maybe at some point, but not now, right? Because of our religious freedoms and because of where we live and because we have a voice, right? This isn't necessarily what we will engage in or what we will endure, but it can happen, right? And in other countries right now, it's happening all over the place. There are are places, parts of the world where if it's found out that you're a Christian, they'll execute you. Like there, this happens it's just not happening to us. We can't, we can't read it just through an American or Western lens. Verse 4. And when he, Herod, had seized him, Peter, he put him in prison, delivering over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made for him 
was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So now here's what happens. So Peter's arrested too. And so his fate is going to be the same thing as James, except they're in the middle of a Jewish feast where it would be bad timing to execute somebody. So they're going to wait till after this feast, after Passover, and then Herod's going to execute Peter too. And so the church in Jerusalem begins to gather and pray. So again, what do we do if we're the church in transit, if we're the church that is engaging something new, if something new is happening that maybe we can't fix, what do we do? Here's another note for you. When persecution kills James and Peter is imprisoned, the church gathers for prayer. Praying together should be common and a first response to trials. Corporate prayer, the church gathering to pray. It is one of the hardest things from our end to gather the church to pray. It's one of the hardest things to get us to do, right? When we have our, like four Sundays, we gather to pray. It is less attended than Sunday mornings for sure, right? It's one of those things that's hard to get us to do, and yet consider that the creator of the universe desires for us to gather together and hear from us. Like it should be something that we're so drawn to, and it's so clearly biblical. When something happens, one of the first things we see is we see the church gather to pray. As soon as the conversion happened in Acts 2, the end of Acts 2 says that they devoted themselves not just to teaching, not just to communion, but also to prayer, right? That that was one of the key four things that was noted about followers of Jesus. They gathered together regularly to pray together, not just home alone. And we see this again. One of the things the church can do is be more prayerful. The church in America needs to be more prayerful, more prayer together. That we can participate in what's going on by gathering and praying. Verse 6, now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side. I love it. He kind of kicks him like, wake up. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his, off his hands. Right? So this angel arrives and shows up and wakes Peter and says, get up, we're leaving, right? Now, there's a lot of talk about angels in culture today. Note that angels are incredibly rare in Scripture. And when they show up, it is incredibly unusual. There is nothing ordinary about this moment, right? Verse 7, let's start that again. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in his cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off Peter's hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals, and he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and he followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel that was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. To be fair, Peter's had this massive vision that just reshaped the view of the church, right? So he's woken up by this this event. He's not sure, like, is this real? Am I dreaming? What's going on, right? That's where he is as the angel leads him out of the prison. Verse 10 says, when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city, and it opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he says, now I'm sure that the Lord was sent, has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod from all that the Jewish people were expecting, right? Notice that last line, he's rescued me from Herod and from all that the Jews were expecting, Right? The church is now encountering opposition on two fronts, one governmental and one another religion. Both are persecuting them, and they're the minority. And Peter's recognizing this, this this angel has delivered him from both things. Verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. John Mark will join our story later, where many were gathered together and praying. So I want you to, I want you to kind of see this. James is executed. Peter's arrested. And the only reason he isn't executed is because it's in the middle of a feast. So they're waiting for the feast to be done. It's a seven day long feast and festival. And so at the end of it, they're going to execute Peter. So the church begins to gather and pray and they're praying for Peter. So what do they want? Peter to be released. What do they want? Peter to live, right? That's what they want. So they're gathering together and praying We can assume they're praying that God would somehow deliver Peter, somehow rescue Peter from the same fate that James had found, from execution, from death. Verse 13, and when Peter knocked at the door, so the church is gathered in this house praying, right? 
And Peter is delivered by an angel out of jail, out of prison, right? Miraculously, and out of the town. So he goes running to this house where the church is gathered to pray. Okay, verse 13, when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran and, and reported Peter was standing at the gate. Now remember, Peter's on the run for his life. He literally is on the run for his life. They want to execute him. They've locked him up so that he can be executed. He's been delivered miraculously. He goes to the place where the church is gathered together to pray. What are they praying for? Him to be released. He knocks at the gate. What happens? She's like, run. She's like, oh, Peter's at the gate. Consider that for a minute. Like, let him in. He's on the run for his life. Like, let Peter in. It gets better. Verse 15. They said to Rhoda, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. Okay, what are they praying for? His release. What do they get? His release. What are they praying for? Same thing, but they don't believe it. So he stands up there knocking, like if they figure out I'm gone, they're coming here. Right? He knocks at the door. It's Peter. She believes, but the rest of the gathered church doesn't believe. There's a, there's a comment to be made about our prayer life in there for sure. Maybe if we believed what we prayed, maybe we'd gather and pray more. But the story's a humorous one. As he stands out there, probably scared to death, right? On the run, literally for his life, and they're inside debating whether or not he's outside. Verse 16. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent. I just want you to see this for a minute. He's on the run for his life. He's banging at the door, and they're like, Peter, she was like, shut up. They want to kill me. Like, never commit a felony with them, right? Not good crime partners. I'm just throwing that out there in case you ever decide to try that life out. But motioning to them with his hand, verse 17, to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. He's like, this house is a bust. I'm out of here, right? <laughs> tell this to James and the others. James now, not the dead James, obviously. This is James, the brother of Jesus, who is now leading the church here in Jerusalem. Right? There's a conversation for a different day, but it's never been Peter that led the church in Jerusalem. Right? And when we see this, he's like, tell them. See, Peter's an apostle who's been sent out to places. By definition, apostle means one who is sent. And so he's like, tell them I'm good, and then he leaves. Verse 18, now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod had searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he, Peter, went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Actually, that is he, Herod, leaves there, goes to Caesarea. So after this happens, and they go looking for him to execute him, but he's gone, and literally Herod puts the guards to death over letting him somehow escape. Verse 20. Now, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Let's just pause. So these are other places that are irrelevant, really, to us. There are other places that don't have anything to do with the story, but what it is, is it's giving us kind of some information about Herod on what's going on, right? This is political unrest under Herod's control, right? Okay. Now, Herod, verse 20, was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. And on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, he took his seat upon the throne and de delivered an oration to them. So he sits on his throne, he, all the pomp and circumstance, and he begins to speak. It says, and the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. 23, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. Love this line. He was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Just in case dead didn't clarify it, he's also eaten by worms. Okay. This really has nothing to do with the church. What it's doing is telling us about the culture in which they're at, right? And then it kind of comes to this, he was eaten by worms and dies. You're like, what does that have to do with our story? It seems random, right? But here's the point. 
the church is constantly living in a world that is changing, right? The leader now is dead. What does that mean? New king coming in, right? Yes, they're under an emperor, a Caesar of Rome, but in their area, they're governed by a king, a Herod. Herod means king. And so this one is now killed by God, right? claiming to be God and not resisting, which was common. Caesar also claimed to be God and all these other things. But God had had enough of him. And what we see is this unrest that they're in. Now just imagine now Tyre and Sidon. They've been struggling because the king's been feeding them. And when he holds back, they struggle. Right? We've been told that there's a famine coming on the whole world by a prophet. Right? Maybe this is the beginning of that. But here's the answer. The church always lives in a world that is constantly changing and in flux. That's always going to be true. It may not be that the church is changing. Sometimes it is. You go through COVID and and maybe there's this restriction or that thing, or we're meeting outside or we're doing this or we're doing that, whatever it might be. Maybe we're in flux. Maybe we send out some of our best leaders and and we we undergo that kind of change. And how do we fill these things? How do we do this? Or We take on something new like a preschool. That's a good thing. It's still a transition, still a change, right? Other churches, we prayed last week for two churches that we partner with that may become one. I'm not sure if it's a done deal or not, but I think it's going to happen. Two churches becoming one church. We've been praying for and supporting a church in LA and Linwood, right, to care for them. We want to see them grow. We partner with other churches. We did an event with uh, Bethany Baptist not long ago. We're going to do another one this summer, right? We partner together. Sometimes the church is in flux. Sometimes the world we live in is in flux. We're in another political season, another presidential election, right? That shakes up America every single time because we put faith in these people to fix things and probably fix things they can't fix, right? Maybe one is better than the other, whatever. The world we live in is always in transition. Let's close up this passage. Ready? Verse 24, it says, but the word of God increased and multiplies. See how this part of the story ends? The word of God increased and multiplied. Every transition piece in Acts has this, but the word of God increased and multiplied, right? The gospel continues to spread. The word of God, the good news about a God who loves us and sent a savior to pay our debt and rescue us from our sin and and take the wrath of God so that we don't. The good news about our life in Christ in this world while we await the world to be remade as God intended it to be. The good news increase and multiply. See, the church isn't shaken. Even when another religious base is fighting with them, that's been going on executions have happened. Now they get government oppression, literally. But it doesn't shake them. They're missing something over here, and they figure it out when the gospel goes out way over here to a people group they would have never gone to. And God reveals that to them, and they adjust and glorify God. They find unity in that. The church is always in a world that is changing. But we don't have to be shaken. We don't have to be taken from that. Yeah, we'll go through things. Things will change. People will change. Leadership will change. Things will change. But the church, the church is stable. So what do we do when the world feels like it's changing all around us and we can't fix it? Last note, we live in a world that is always changing, but we who are Christ's endure in the spirit and watch the gospel expand. The church of Jesus cannot be overcome. The church of Jesus cannot be overcome. We may lose someone. James may die. Peter may leave. The church may move from its center being here to its center being over there. That's okay. The gospel will continue to multiply, expand, increase, because the church of Jesus will never be overcome. So what do we do with this? How do we apply this to our lives today? So here's some ideas. For me... I want to remind myself that the church is always experiencing change, and I can't stop that, internal and external change. It just always is. We're imperfect. So I want to focus on praying more corporately with our church, and I want to focus on the stability of the gospel over the instability of the world we live in. 
For those of you who've been walking with Jesus for some time, your job is to equip and disciple like Paul and Barnabas who go to Antioch to bring stability in the gospel to the church. That's your job. If you've been walking with Jesus for longer time than others, you more mature in your faith, that's your job is to be that discipleship base, that, that leadership base here. For those of you that are brand new to the faith, learn that the world around us changes, but Jesus never does. Jesus remains the same. No matter what goes on, no matter what takes place, Jesus remains the same. If you have never come to faith, if you have never heard that there's a God who loves you and gave a Savior, gave himself for you, to reconcile you with the God who made the world, you've never heard that before or you've never responded, you've never placed your trust in Jesus for everything, for you, I would say, trust in Christ. The only stable thing we have is the God who made the world we live in. The only stable thing we have is our salvation. For parents with kids, teach your kids how to live in a world who opposes us. We may encounter opposition by culture, we may encounter it by government at some point. We may encounter it by another religious base. Who knows? We already live in a world that opposes us. We're already told that our way of thinking is arcane and, and, and out of date and, and repressive or this or that and the other thing. It's not true, but it, we're told that. Teach our children that we don't live in the world as a world, but we're separate from it. And the world will always oppose us. Let's take two, three, four minutes. Let's turn to somebody around you. And what's your takeaway? What's something you heard today? that you want to apply to your lives.